is hardware obfuscation and is going to be given by Mark Furbiak, which is also from University of Bochum. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, today I will present our results on uh, FSM-based hardware obfuscation. Um, so first, um, let's start with a uh, simple ob uh, observation. So the modern hardware design flow is heavily globalized and involves numerous stakeholders. And uh, since the implementation and intellectual property is uh, visible to numerous untrusted stakeholders. Um, this is uh, an issue for IP owners. Uh, for example, just uh, assume uh, untrusted offshore fab who may overproduce um, chips as they already have the masks. Um, a potential solution to this problem is um, to deploy IP theft protection and obfuscation um, methods to the design in order to, to hinder this issue and achieve some form of uh, post-manufacturing controllability for the IP owner. And um, here one strand of research um, has analyzed a finite state machine um, based schemes and uh, commonly it is believed that they are secure and provide uh, strong protection. And uh, our basic research um, question was, yeah, how secure are these schemes actually? And note that uh, in this talk, I will just focus on the dynamic state deflection scheme. The, the other schemes are uh, in the paper, detailed and uh, described. So uh, before we come to uh, all the FSM stuff, um, we first uh, state our adversary model. Um, we assume that the adversary has access to the gate level netlist equipped uh, with uh, some form of FSM obfuscation and he has no a priori information um, about the module hierarchies or internal names of, of the gates and signals. And of course, uh, the goal is uh, to deobfuscate the design and to commit some form of IP infring infringement. So uh, for example, one instantiation would be an untrusted fab who wants to overproduce chips. And uh, now let's have a look at the dynamic state deflection scheme. So uh, basically we have two parts. So in the middle, the blue um, original FSM is equipped with two other parts, a red obfuscation FSM and the black black hole FSM. The key idea is now that the new initial state um, is now not in the blue part, but in the red part. You see in the uh, bottom left state with the ingoing arrow. This is like the new initial state. And the key idea um, about the scheme is now um, we have an enabling key. Basically, this is a sequence from this new initial state to the original one uh, in blue. So you would need all these uh, inputs to uh, go there. This is the enabling key. And this is only known to honest parties. And the thing with the uh, black hole FSM is that a valid key has to be present um, in the original states to ensure um, that the design is working properly. And our question here was how challenging is FSM reverse engineering and how secure is the scheme? Because if we could somehow reverse engineer the finite state machine um, from the gate level netlist and uh, obtain the state transition graph, we could directly read the enabling key and then, for example, overproduce uh, chips or do whatever uh, kind of IP infringement uh, we want to do. So um, first, uh, in the following, I will uh, talk a little about automated FSM reverse engineering strategies. And with this knowledge in mind, we will come back to the um, dynamic state deflection scheme. And later on, uh, I will uh, present a novel FSM obfuscation primitive that we developed um, that is suited for FPGAs called hardware nanomites. So when you want to reverse engineer um, FSM gates, um, it has some um, properties. So below, um, there is a general model of a MUA automata uh, implemented in hardware. So in the middle, you have the state memory that stores the current state. And uh, together with the input and the transition logic realizes the state transition function. And of course, there's also some output logic to steer some complex data path, for example, some, some CPU data path or some AES or whatsoever. And even though um, this model appears to be very basic, it has some inherent characteristics that are very important for us in order to determine the gates that implement the gate level netlist, uh, that implement the FSM in the gate level netlist. 
Um, and the first thing is uh, we have the first property. Um, this is register control signal. So basically, the state memory has some control signals like a clock, uh, enable signal, set and reset signals. And uh, typically for FSMs, each flip-flop um, has the same set of control signals. So we group all flip-flops in the gate level netlist according um, to the set of control signals. Um, the second observation uh, in this graph is that we have a strongly connected component. Um, basically, this means there's a circle uh, in, in this uh, figure from the state memory via the transition logic and back to the state memory. And in particular, the strongly connected component is further characterized. Um, we have, uh, when you have a look at like each flip-flop in the state memory, and you go via the state transition logic back to the same uh, flip-flop, you have just a combinational logic feedback path, so there's no flip-flop in between. The second observation here is um, that basically each flip-flop in the state memory um, influences and depend on each other for the um, state transition function. So if this sounds complex, we will have an example later um, on this property. And last but not least, um, there is the control behavior. So the state memory uh, typically connects also to some output logic uh, that is not in the strongly connected component to realize the control signals and steer the data path. So uh, with these uh, four properties in mind, we can identify which gates um, in the gate level netlist belong to an FSM candidate. Um, but still, we then have the gates, um, but not the state transition graph. So this is uh, the next step. Um, so where we want to determine the state transition graph from the gates. So, um, and there's a simple example here shown on the right. Um, so assume uh, all the gates and, and signals have been derived uh, by the different properties. So we have just a single input bit I, a single output bit O, and three gates. And if you have a look at the graphic representation, it looks like this and basically reassembles um, our model that we have seen before. Uh, so we have the XOR gate G1, the flip-flop G2, and the inverter G3 that realizes the output logic. And now we want to obtain the state transition graph from the circuit. So how do we start? So assume um, G2 is initialized with zero. So we start with an initial state as zero. And uh, since we have the output, which is an inverter, uh, the output O is one because we invert the zero bit and just get one. So, and what happens next is we basically brute the uh, brute force uh, the input i. Uh, we start uh, with the zero, and we know G2 stores a zero because we have the zero state. The input is zero, so zero x or zero still zero. So we stay in the uh, in the state as zero. And now, uh, once we have the input i as one, then uh, we know we have a new state called s1 that stores the one in G2. And of course, the output is then zero because it's inverted. And then we basically um, do the same again. For um, state S1, we have a one in G2. And for the input zero, we stay in S1. And for the one, we go back. So basically, this is the key idea um, how to um, determine the state transition graph from the FSM gates. And in the paper, um, we have formulated this as two algorithms. Basically, we start with the gate level netlist. We perform the topological analysis that uses ba basically um, these four properties as shown before. Uh, we get a set of FSM candidates, so the gates that might implement an FSM, and then we perform the Boolean function analysis to uh, just extract the state transition graph and further information uh, for the FSM. So all the details uh, are there in the paper. Um, what is important, um, so the complexity of this Boolean function analysis is basically the number of states multiplied with two to the power of the number of inputs. So for each state, we brute force all the inputs. So this is important for later. So with this knowledge of FSM op uh, reverse engineering in mind, let's uh, come back to the dynamic state deflection. So um, as noted before, we have some dynamic state deflection scheme with the three parts, the original FSM, the red part, and the black hole part, and the enabling key is just known to honest parties. And in a case study, we implemented an AES circuit and equipped um, the AES state machine with the dynamic state deflection scheme. And uh, we used a 12-bit enabling key, 14 obfuscation uh, states, and five black hole states per original one, which basically reassembled the uh, 
evaluation numbers from the previous works. And uh, now let's start uh, with the topological analysis first. Um, so our topological analysis said, okay, there's a candidate. Um, this candidate has eight flip-flops, 21 inputs, and um, some score. The score basically says the influence and dependence is 0 0.625. What this means is um, we measure how many flip-flops influence and depend on each other. So typically, um, you would expect that we have a score um, of at least one, so that each bit, uh, that each flip-flop influences and depends on each other. A value of zero would mean the opposite. And here we see we have basically two groups, and we will focus on the group FF1 to FF6 because we see, hey, um, it might be that FF. Uh, 7 and FF8 are um, just false positive uh, detected uh, flip-flops and uh, here in the output uh, of our command line tool we see, okay, um, this group might be of further interest, let's have a look here. And when we analyze um, this group further with the Boolean function analysis, we get this nicely uh, colored graph. Um, this is directly from the AES circuit, so, um, and it's also uh, we were able to color this graph, which is kind of great because, again, we have strongly connected components in there. What this means is, for example, have a look at um, the black, black hole states. So every black hole state can just um, visit each other, so they can't um, go back to the blue state. So they form a strongly connected component, basically a circle that um, cannot, be, uh, cannot be left. The same holds also for the obfuscation FSM. So basically, from for each red state, I can just uh, I can reach every other red state. But once I would um, leave uh, the red state via the um, edge there uh, shown, which uh, connects to the blue one, uh, I wouldn't be able to go back to the red state. So red states and black states form a strongly connected component, and also um, the blue part basically uh, forms a, a strongly connected component because for blue parts um, I can only uh, I can reach all other blue parts but once I would go into um, the black states I couldn't go back to the blue part. Uh, what is important is um, that uh, our uh, computational complexity um, for, for the size took around five minutes on a standard laptop. Um, the topological analysis for this one was like done in, in two minutes. And what is most importantly now, when we have the state transition graph, um, you see these states in the uh, red um, obfuscation FSM marked as a square. So basically, these are the states and the state transition functions that are of particular interest because we now could simply read out the enabling key from this graph and, for example, overproduce um, chips uh, or do any other form of uh, IP infringement. Um, summary of results, so for um, this part uh, we also had a look at, at the other schemes. We found several um, issues and they are all described in the paper. Um, lessons learned from this, um, basically the topological analysis yields the FSM gate, so we directly know, for even for a large um, gate level netlist, we know there might be an FSM implemented in, in these kind of gates. And, um, also, an issue was that we were able to separate the um, obfuscation part from the original part. So, um, in the uh, last um, part with the dynamic state deflection, you have seen that we could also uh, analyze the state transition graph um, for circles. And the complexity of Boolean function analysis um, was also not as high as uh, previously thought. So, um, let's... Uh, briefly come to um, our new primitive. Um, our main idea was, okay, hey, the topological analysis always yields um, the FSM gate, so let's try to hide this information. And um, we did it with a partial reconfiguration, so basically um, the state transition graph shown on the right um, is split into several partial designs and um, each partial design is then uh, reconfigured in uh, this dynamic physical block, the red part, and together with the state register and the uh, static data pass computes the original functionality. What is important here that partial reconfiguration yields really interesting properties. So first, we have self-modifying hardware because uh, during different points in time, the dynamic physical block implements other functionality. 
And also we have a nice anti-simulation primitive because simulating partial uh, reconfigurable designs is uh, very hard at the moment. Um, let's have a look at the evaluation numbers. So basically what is important is the line uh, marked in red. So the complete static design appears to be really large with like 28k, uh, 28k LUTs and 30k flip-flops. Um, but note that um, this was for a non-SOC FPGA. For a SOC FPGA we could repurpose um, the, for example, uh, on a Xilinx Zync board could repurpose the A9 processor instead of the MicroBlaze. Uh, micro and uh, most of these components, like the DDR controller or um, uh, the Axi Smart Connect, are also found in general design, so they could be also repurposed um, for our part, and then the overhead is not as large. Um, the part for the dynamic physical block is um, really small because it's just implementing the state transition function with um, 240 um, lookup tables and 320 flip flops. And uh, in the paper, we have also a security analysis why it's challenging to reverse engineer. So in conclusion, um, we demonstrated several generic and semi-automated strategies on state-of-the-art FSM obfuscation schemes and were able to bypass their protection. And uh, we proposed a novel FSM obfuscation primitive for field programmable, field programmable gate arrays. So with this, uh, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any question for Mark? Hello. Uh, we have results that compare the normal. I'm here. Ah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you have results that compare the normal FSM and with your with your proposed solution? The result that compare the GE, the gate equivalent. The gate equivalent. Ah, uh, are the the hardware GE? Uh, yeah. The original FSM and the are uh, your solution FSM. Yeah. Is it? Do you have results on that? You, this num or what do you mean? Uh, the original FSM, the yeah. without ah, um, obfuscation. Yeah, I mean the, the original FSM was like really, really small. I mean this was like a, like five state FSM, like which is I don't know uh, six flip flops and like I don't know twenty LUTs or something. So this is really small. This is more um, like a primitive to realize any kind of obfuscation. So this is like first the ecosystem to realize then uh, something. For example, it could be that you use um, this implementation um, to also have some um, previous um, obfuscation mode um, for your design and then later on just have your normal design that you don't have this large overhead um, in, in the hardware, but just have it once at startup and it, then it's heavily obfuscated and then it's like uh, easier in the end. So yeah, because I want to know the, the overhead of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the overhead, like just if you do it once, is like pretty large. I, I think uh, the design ran with like 100 megahertz due to the DDR controller and it took like 485,000 cycles to do like five reconfigurations. When I remember correctly, I'm, I'm not sure it's in the paper. <laughs> Thank you. Another question for Mark? Okay, I do have one quick question. Yes, yes one. Oh, good. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, one question when about the uh, the previous the framework uh, where you did analysis of the state machine. Yes. Uh, what happens if my state machine used BRAM instead of flip flops? Um, yeah. I mean, uh, we didn't handle BRAM because, um, uh, but it's uh, also potential because um, I mean. Um, then just the state memory is just implemented in a VRAM, but it will have the same property. So there will be a cycle again. There will be just combinational logic um, for the um, uh, state transition function and so on. So um, this is like uh, easily added um, to uh, our like program. But then the problem is like if for the VRAM, if I have all the states in the VRAM, how are you going to know if one state goes to another? How do you know the dependency of states? Um, because we analyze the input as well. I mean, yes, we have all the states, um, but um, we basically brute force the input and we know, okay, we have um, some initial state because it's uh, somewhere the, the design is initialized. And um, with the simulated input, we know which is like the next um, state that is then uh, read from some address and stored uh, somewhere. Okay. 
Okay. We don't have time for other questions, so let's thank Mark and Max again. And I'll give the microphone to Pierre Alain for the next session. <laughs>